Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Rachel Paul with IAAP, and you're here today for our second session in our Higher Education webinar series focusing on executive leadership buy-in. Before we get started with today's program, just a few items to go over. We do have closed captioning provided. You can select the closed captioning icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And also posted in the chat is a third-party captioning link if you prefer. Today's session will be recorded and made available afterwards. So we'll get that information out to you, how you can access the recording on the IAAP YouTube channel. We will be taking questions today. I encourage you to leave your questions in the Q&A and we'll get to those as we go along. And uh, the chat will be monitored for any technical issues or any general uh, information or questions that come up. So I am happy to turn the program over to Lori Crescent for introductions and to get started. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And I'd also like to thank the IAAP for offering this series. I think it's gonna be very helpful for those of us in higher education. Christopher, I wanna thank you again for the invitation to uh, put this panel together. And again, to Rachel for facilitating our session today. We hope that each of you are going to leave with a nugget of information to help you move your accessibility effort forward. We're over this hour, we're going to be highlighting three to four topical areas, which will help to showcase a few of the pages from our play playbooks, which, is, which have helped us succeed. However, it's not going to be a concrete step-by-step -step instruction book for establishing a position which would sit at the right hand of your president or chancellor. Each campus is unique, each environment is unique, and each leadership hierarchy is unique. We will offer experience on how we have developed a voice at the table, either directly or indirectly, how we've determined best strategies of how to move the accessibility effort forward in each of our unique environments. And we're also gonna provide some examples of activities and strategies that are key to our work. To help you understand the context of where we're coming from and to paint a picture of our institutions and the ro role we play, we're just gonna give you a brief introduction, uh, a little bit more in depth than, than our name and, and position. So Tawny, would you like to start? Certainly, hello everyone. Um, I am Tawny McManus. I am the Assistant Vice Provost for Accessibility and Disability Services at UMBC, which is the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Most people only know UMBC as the words. Um, we are one of a 12 institution system. Um, so that poises us a little differently than my colleagues here today um, in terms of when you're looking at um, this, my role specifically, it may not exist the same um, in my peer institutions, although we work very closely together and do model each other in some ways. Um, I sit in academic affairs and I report to the vice provost um, for academic affairs and had previously reported to the provost directly. Um, in you know, some offices, accessibility and disability services um, can be in many different, apart different departments. And I think part of us um, speaking to you all today is to highlight that as how we are um, housed in different units and sometimes doing some of the same work. Um, it may have to come down to funding and structure. Um, my institution is 14,000 students, 11,000 are undergrad. We have about 500 full-time faculty, 300 or so part-time faculty. Um, we're a very diverse campus. We're right on the line between Baltimore City and Baltimore County, about a half hour north of DC. Um, our minority enrollment population is about 52%, and we represent over 100 countries in our um, student diversity. We are the number one institution nationally for producing Black and African American undergrads who go on to MD and PhDs. So we're a, we're a, a research university, we're a public university um, with a very diverse um, population of students, faculty, and staff. Um, I think the other thing, um, you know, just to say in my role is uh, unique to me is that I have a uh, a seat at the table in multiple hats. Um, and so I oversee the Student Disability Services Office, I oversee employee accommodations, and then I am also kind of the general accessibility person on our campus. Um, I am the only person on campus with accessibility in their title. Um, so I will uh, share that, and I think later we'll talk a little bit about how they came to be. So I will pass it off to Kyle. Sure, thanks, Tony. Uh, my name is Kyle Shackbett. I'm the Assistant Director of Digital Accessibility Services at Harvard University. 
and uh, have been at the institution for um, five and a half years working on digital accessibility, uh, kind of starting our efforts housed around different parts of the university. Um, so we're a large research university, tens of thousands of students, um, many, many more counting, uh, you know, certificate programs, executive and lifelong learning education programs, non-degree programs, um, but massive uh, scope uh, ranging from obviously undergrad populations to professional programs, law, medicine, um, education, public health, those sorts of things, and high research output. So uh, the work we do varies um, kind of across those different schools and subject types um, and, and a lot of, of public facing content as well as student faculty staff um, focused content. Uh, like I mentioned, I've been at the university kind of leading digital accessibility efforts for um, five or six years. And um, currently I'm housed in the IT organization, uh, Hewitt, Harvard University IT. Um, but I've led the same work at Harvard um, from university disability uh, resources, right? Or from our vice provost for a learning office uh, in different capacities. So um, can talk some about that over time and, and how we've uh, kind of evolved where it might be housed organizationally, something that varies a lot by institution and can work in, in different situations. There's no one size fits all approach to uh, diverse institution types within higher education, um, but can certainly uh, speak to some of what we've done. Um, I currently lead a team of uh, 10 full-time uh, staff members dedicated to digital accessibility, um, relatively new. That team's been around for about 18 months. Uh, which is really exciting. We obviously, uh, we partner with student disability services uh, in our different schools around the campus um, and many other people who are working on accessibility in their work, but do have a, a relatively large team of people dedicated to digital accessibility within IT, um, which is exciting and, and we're happy to do it. So I'm sure we'll talk more about uh, different structures and, and committees and governance setups and, and leadership over the course, but that's a little bit about me and our institution. Um, Lori, happy to hear about you. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. I'm the coordinator of academic accessibility here at UVA, and this position sits within the executive vice president and provost office. I report directly to the vice provost for academic affairs. My role is to ensure the accessibility of the academic experience for our students and faculty. And as you can imagine, it spiders out quickly. I look at accessibility from a holistic perspective encompassing both the physical, digital environments as well as, as the attitudinal environment. For our current academic year, UVA has roughly 25,000 students and that breaks down to about 17,000 undergrad and 8,000 grad students. We've got roughly 10,000 employees, uh, 3,300 faculty and 6,700 staff. We have 12 colleges or schools with over 15 libraries and associated labs and any number of centers and initiatives which all make up our academic environment. To address accessibility, we look at the people who have 100% focus on accessibility or disability in our world here. The Student Disability Access Center is the entity which provides the guidance and accommodations for our student population. They have a staff of 10, which in addition to the director and associate director includes an accessibility specialist, an assistive technology specialist, some counselors and a part-time part coordinator of deaf, hard of hearing and media accessibility services. And these folks are the practitioners. Then we also have an ADA office, which is located within our Office for Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights. They have the focus on our compliance with the ADA in our hiring and workplace practices, along with our implementation of the ADA in our physical and digital environments for both the academic and medical worlds of UVA. There is an ADA coordinator and a deputy ADA coordinator. We also, as Tawny, uh, explained and both Kyle explained, we have a small number of positions scattered around the university where accessibility is a portion of their responsibility, particularly in the digital space uh, and within our facility management organization. And then there's me. So for our university, we have a total of 13 people 
who have focused specifically on disability and accessibility. 10 of those are strictly practitioners within the student world. I can't do my job without working closely with these folks, especially as well as others across the university. So this is gonna lead us into our first topic. When a position is situated in a relatively high spot on the org chart, what is the reality versus the perception of its influence? Does this automatically mean that you now hold a magic wand and everything is right with the world? Kyle, you wanna lead us into this topic? Be happy to, Lori. So uh, spoiler alert, I haven't found my magic wand yet for sure, but um, please let me know if, if uh, you have. I would love to hear about it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> work on digital accessibility from within our IT org, but have dotted around uh, throughout the institution. Um, <clears throat> I've worked at other institutions, right, where it has been the case that we have tried to get positions for digital accessibility. So we know there's a wide range of how uh, dedicated resources, if you will, um, work on this. I think it's, it's great. Obviously, I mentioned earlier, we have a large team working on accessibility, uh, centrally speaking, that uh, surprisingly doesn't magically fix everything. Um, I'm sure everybody says this, but even with a large team, I could double the number of people working on accessibility at the university and keep everybody really, really busy. So um, I, I don't think you could you could list a number of feasible possibility um, that I would say, yeah, that that's totally right. I think there's so much opportunity for us to improve accessibility, but a big part of what we do is try to train and give resources and expand capacity of content owners to improve their accessibility. I do think it's important uh, within institutions for us to have people with sufficient um, authority, right? Um, I don't know of any college campus that I've ever attended or worked on, and that includes many, where um, there, there's no monolith, where everybody in the institution says, oh, someone told me to do something, I'm gonna do it no matter what. Um, that's one of the awesome things about higher education and our diverse institutions is that we have uh, thousands and thousands in many cases of autonomous independent researchers and thinkers, which is awesome and exciting and they often operate with a lot of autonomy. Uh, which makes our job working on digital accessibility really challenging because there's no one lever that controls everything, no matter uh, what title you have or where you are in an org chart. Um, I think so much of the work that we do happens through um, uh, influence and a little bit of advocacy, right? Uh, so the, the way that I use my uh, proverbial magic wand, haven't found the real one yet, is definitely by uh, building partnerships, collaborating, Lori mentioned the holistic nature of accessibility, um, really trying to share with people why accessibility matters, why it's important. Um, probably wor worth noting, I am somebody with a disability myself, so I am both a beneficiary of uh, and kind of a, an avatar sometimes of that work of why it's important, um, but you don't need to be to be advocating for accessibility and people with disabilities on campus. So uh, definitely finding partnerships, expanding um, capabilities, but it's not just, I have a lot of power and I say you have to do it. Um, people are gonna do much better work on a much more sustainable way if we can train them why including people with disabilities uh, in the use of our technology matters and, and why, you know, we want everybody to access all the awesome teaching and, and research that our institutions produce. And with a huge percentage of the population that's going to need affordances for accessibility, um, let's build those in and be inclusive from the start, right? And so that's a much better framework to kind of try to convince our, our, our people to produce things. And yes, there are legal ramifications and there are policy implications. All of that is really important too, but we try to start from, from that viewpoint. I think I'd like to, to bring a couple other perspectives into that because um, you know so many of the things that you're saying are, are right on target for all of us. Um, and I think the number one question I get is certainly, well, how did you get there? How did you get that role? How did you even get a seat at the table? Um, and I, I you know, genuinely think many of you that are attending today, that's exactly what you want to know is, 
who paid for it and how'd you get that title, right? Because uh, you're thinking we need this um, and there seems to be a disconnect in how to get there. Um, so I didn't come in with this title. Um, I came in as the director of the Student Disability Services Office. Um, I was somebody very interested in digital accessibility and you know reading about the lawsuits and as a director of a student office you're always trying to be one step ahead of the game is how can I keep our institution um, from getting a complaint and how can we be doing the right thing for our students so in any institution there's this balance right we have to follow policies and procedures um, and nobody wants to hear that we have to work from a compliance perspective but we we do it's federal law right the work that we're doing um, and sometimes there's a disconnect between you know is there enough funding to make sure that we're doing accessibility right that everybody is included um, and so you know i was somebody who came in i think having a broader vision than what my position was um, and truly caring about my students and the the problems they were reporting um, but also being part of a, a system i had peers who were getting office of civil rights complaints and me feeling i'm a sitting duck if i don't take some actions right so who can i get to partner um, i can tell you you know i was i was trying to have meetings with legal counsel um, what, are we, what are we doing about this me reaching out to our cio saying um, some of our peers seem to be working on an it accessibility policy where we don't seem to have one um, and you know it's it's an uncomfortable conversation to have when I don't work in IT and this is a, a senior leader, you know, I'm approaching him almost in the perspective of why don't you have this right and I have to find out the way to say that in a collegial I kind of want to help you, but I don't want to write your policy way. Um, IT isn't my area, but I know a lot about it, so I could help. Um, and so I think, you know, what Kyle said about the partnerships is just was an essential component to me knowing who's doing this work already, because nobody I could find on my campus had accessibility in their title. But like Lori said, our facilities management people are doing accessibility on a daily basis, um, maybe more so focused on the physical access because of ADA standards, um, but they're doing that work, but it wasn't naming it that way. Um, our instructional technology staff was doing accessibility work, but in their workshops and their trainings weren't using the word. Um, so part of me was thinking we need to, to brand this better. We need to make it an awareness. We are already doing some of this work. We're not getting credit for it and we're not um, showcasing it. Um, so, you know, some changes were able to happen for me is that our employee accommodation um, role and our ADA coordinator role had been shifted around a bit, one time in, in HR and then one time um, in a human relations office that was switching to an OEI office. Um, and there was only one person doing that work. Um, and I had some conversations with the provost about um, a unique model that we wanted to create where accessibility and disability services was centralized to a unit. So that really anything about accessibility and disability services could come to us, but we didn't have any more funding to do it. So we were expected to be the, the resource knowledge base, the connectors that we can't pay for a new enterprise software that's gonna scan the website, but we can be the ones that are going to bring to the table the why. And I, I always bring in that user experience. So that's what really makes a difference for buy-in to me is that when you're, when you're trying to get people to listen about, hey, we wanna do this, we need another position, we need other people to, to be part of it, they need to understand the why. And you can come with the compliance lawsuit because that gets the ears to open and they all wanna know about it, but then they also might be skeptical about, well, how likely are we gonna get it? Isn't everybody getting sued? Or, you know, maybe we can kind of skate by for a while. Um, but I think you also really need to bring that human perspective because that's what then really gets, um, you know, people involved. If you're leading a training about, um, you know, something detailed like the, the WCAG standards, to show a video of what it sounds like for a blind student um, when they're reading a page completely changes the conversation because it's not real to people until they see what the barrier is. When we talk about those curb cuts and people start to think to themselves, I don't have a wheelchair, but I use them every day for my stroller, for my kid, I get it now. You know, So I think the huge part for me was coming to conversations with people, reaching out, seeing who was interested, and then giving a practical explanation to them about why this is so important, how you're excluding people every day if we don't work on this. Um, and then I kind of stick it to them at the end with saying enrollment gets, gets impacted. You will lose students when they go to your front-facing website 
and they can't read it. And then they think your institution doesn't care about accessibility. And when they start to hear dollars and cents in that way, your senior leadership starts to listen. Um, so, you know, my, my nuggets are is that you don't have to come in necessarily at the top. You don't have to have the provost and the president saying we need an accessibility person, even though we're seeing a pretty good trend that that's happening at a lot of institutions. But you need to have somebody passionate and you need to have your eyes and ears open about who cares about this so that you can start to make those connections and start to figure out where could I throw this in um, at different uh, at different times in meetings. Hey, have we thought about this? Um, and people jump on board, people start to stand up, you know, it becomes a movement. Um, and then you're able to say like I did, hey, I'm doing three jobs. I think we need to really discuss what this position should look like and who else should be doing this work. Lori, did you wanna go to the perception reality? <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a shot here. Uh, <laughs> So there's no magic wand here either. Uh, so Kyle, when you find yours, let me know when, when, where I should start looking. Uh, I think that both of you have brought up some really good points that I'm going to just build on, uh, especially Tawny, your, your points about uh, naming the effort and showcasing the effort and bringing that to a higher level and then finding out who really cares about this effort. So that kind of mirrors what my experience has been at UVA. This position that I'm in, the coordinator of academic accessibility didn't exist until 2014. And I'm the first person in the position, so, which is really good because I'm not compared to anybody and I can shape it the way uh, our current situation warrants. So I've been working in accessibility since the late 90s. And during that time, from, up from, from the, say, 1998 through, oh, golly, 2011, it was roughly 10% of my job. So I've had my feet in it for a while. During that time, there were seven years of reports and justifications and lobbying to create this position that I'm currently in. And it was just as just as Tawny was mentioning, finding out who cares and finding out who um, who brings that human perspective, you know, how can you bring that human perspective to this, this effort? So those seven years of reporting and justification led to finally the creation of, of this position. And then it was, where do we put this? At, at first, it, you know, again, at that time, we had the Student Disability Access Center. There was only four people in it at that time. Um, there was a ADA coordinator that was part-time. And then I was like 10% of my position. So uh, where do we place this position now that we're gonna have full-time 100% accessibility? Um, and it's gonna, we don't know what the focus is going to be. So there was no playbook. Uh, they decided to put it in the provost office to offer a broader reach. Uh, so it wasn't just focused in the digital space. It wasn't just focused in the physical space. So the intention is to be proactive and develop a strategic approach. But what ends up happening is that I'm really more reactionary and, and addressing immediate issues and then taking advantage of opportunities, opportunities that present themselves along the way. I have a limited budget for one-time funding opportunities, but not for ongoing expenses. So this, is, this creates challenges, but what that forces me to do is go out and find uh, like-minded people, right? So I need to partner. I need to do a lot of partnering with our Center for Teaching Excellence, our, our group of instructional designers, um, our VP for uh, academic technology. So it forces more conversations. And by having those conversations, all of a sudden, what you are trying to do is brought to a different level within the university. So excuse the sirens going by. Um, the, the, uh, hang on. Uh, it forces conversations. For instance, when I have a conversation with the VP for academic, uh, for academic technology, all of a sudden his voice now brings it to a higher level within the IT world. 
So it's this indirect and direct place at the table. Uh, when we look at how my position is funded and how this effort is funded, we take the approach at UVA that the unit or department producing the content event or tool is responsible for the accessibility of that content event or tool. Just as that department is responsible for the accuracy of the data, the privacy of the data, the security of the digital asset that they're putting into play, accessibility falls right into that. Now, is that met with a warm embrace? No, not necessarily, but we have to start somewhere. So we put that responsibility on the provider of the content. Now, we can still offer centralized solutions. So one thing that we do is when uh, an assistive technology is identified as a, an accommodation for many folks, then we'll look at how can we make that available to the university as a university-wide solution. And so we look at concurrent licensing or uh, perpetual licensing and offering that to everybody. And that's what I can do is I can help foster that. Um, Lori, I think that's a really great point. I would just underscore is that, you know, I think we have these ideals that, you know, I think I mentioned that before, that we think to do accessibility and to be accessible, that there's a certain thing we need, right? A certain number of staff, a certain title, a certain amount of money. Um, and in reality, that's not really how it works. For all of us, it has been, you know, kind of this ongoing progression. And there isn't an end point, right? We're not fully accessible, you know, your, your content is only as good as what people are posting and putting up. So, you know, there's always this need for it because there's, there's people that don't know about this work. Um, and so I think, you know, having those, those partnerships is that, you know, you're bringing that awareness to the table. And every time there's new staff or new people, we're kind of in this ongoing educating relationship um, that we're hoping then kind of just spreads out. Then the whole department knows about it. Or maybe you get the opportunity to present to a unit or a department, which I do a lot of. Um, you know, it's it, we can think that it's one unit's responsibility. And then when you sit down and break it down, um, it really is a widespread university commitment. Um, and so everybody does kind of have to step up and allocate some funding for it, but nobody's ever told them that. Um, and so I think, you know, the beauty of our positions is we've been able to try to interject the importance and then we start to get to the table. And I'm gonna give you fair warning that once you get yourself a seat at a table, you're gonna start getting invited to a lot of tables and you're gonna be in a lot of committee meetings and there's going to be an expectation that you're going to chime in on, um, on, on a lot of things. Um, whether it's spending a lot of meetings on COVID planning this past year, like I have been, right, <laughs> and reopening. Um, but, you know, I think that's a wonderful thing because once you're invited to the table, you know you have a captive audience who cares and they want to do the right thing. Um, so I, that, that's my kind of extension of what you're saying is I, I don't want anybody to leave thinking I need to go back and ask for somebody in the provost's office for accessibility. Um, because certainly the takeaway today is that doesn't solve um, your issue. It's your stakeholders, your partnerships, getting the buy-in from the other people that are interested and people starting to say, is my department accessible? What, what could I do about it? Who could help me? Yeah, and Tawny, that's leading us right into our second topic here um, about how do, you, how do you get this place at the table and, and do you need to have this high level spot on the hierarchy? Is that necessary? And you just started the conversation right there. So I know that you also have some really strong feelings around relationships. Both you and Kyle have strong relation, have strong feelings around the importance of relationships. So Tawny, why don't you start on that and then Kyle chime in and I've got a few uh, ideas on the back end as well. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, I was in a good position where um, when I first started as a uh, the Student Disability Services Office was housed in academic affairs, um, and that did report through the provost line. Um, and that's a that's a powerful place to be because the provost is looking at a lot of things, um, student learning, you know, working with enrollment and those front facing pieces, working with the CIO, um, you know, so it, it was a great place to be. Now, you know, many disability offices are housed in student affairs. Um, so that can pose a challenge because you may have to kind of go up the student affairs chain to then get to the other side side. Um, but it's still possible. You know, it doesn't really matter where you sit as long as you have the mission. Um, so for me, 
having the support of the provost was great but it really didn't impact the other units per se. He wasn't going to go and tell the other units what they needed to do. Um, so it really did rely on me to build those relationships. Um, so you know, I had conversations with the VP and the assistant VP in student affairs. Um, I made legal counsel be some of my closest friends, right? <laughs> However you feel about lawyers or not, you're gonna need them at some times. You're gonna need to run ideas by them if you're trying to put policies forth and wording and all of that, um, help you with, with reviewing maybe some legal cases that you wanna use as ammo of um, why we need to do this. Um, you know, I, I work on employee accommodations as well. So having my partners in HR, which is sometimes, um, you know, the ADA coordinator might be in HR. And, um, you know, I was blessed that they put the ADA coordinator under me. So we're kind of co-ADA coordinators for campus. Um, we created an equity inclusion office about a year ago. Um, and, you know, they focus on a little bit of everything. Title IX has been a huge component of their work, um, but they do dis discrimination for, you know, really anything that would come up at the university. So having a close relationship and partnership with them, um, you know, some campuses are doing an inclusion council or a president's commission on disability. And, you know, if there's those types of committees and groups on your campus, those are people you need to connect with. Um, and sometimes they may have a different viewpoint on some of the issues. And so you coming to the table with your lens is super important because there are people that are passionate about it, but you're all bringing a different perspective, whether it's personal experience of disability, someone you know, or just um, practical barriers in your day-to-day -day work. Um, Facilities management, I never thought that would be an area that I'd be super interested in. And boy, am I in a lot of construction meetings. Um, and they appreciate it. Um, and so, you know, you can think about this isn't my area, like I said about IT, um, but they want your perspective at the table because you bring a new perspective. They may not always appreciate it when I tell them that they're building something new and they haven't thought about this and it needs to be 500 square feet bigger. Um, but I think, you know, you come into the table, they start to recognize it and you get invited back, which I think is pretty powerful because whether they want a name that they need you or not, you get invited back because you said something in that meeting that truly made a difference. Um, so to me, it was very grassroots, if you want to say so, as reaching out, trying to get meetings, offering, hey, I'm available to do any kinds of trainings. Um, and once people started doing that, I do think there's an element, especially across faculty departments of, oh, well, that department's doing that. Why aren't we doing that? And that's where you get some of those invites. Um, so relationships are hugely important to me. And I think building trust, knowing what you're talking about, so coming in with a spiel prepared about the importance of it, you can use that spiel 50 times um, to every unit you meet with, um, but they need that connection. They need to get to know you. And then that will spread to the other units. Kyle, you wanna talk totally about agree. relationship? Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, what Tony said about the, the building partnerships and, and collaboration, particularly around issues of diversity, equity, inclusion that are um, growing in, in kind of importance and receptivity a lot on our, our campuses, I think, generally speaking. Um, and if, if disability isn't a part of those conversations about diversity and inclusion, then um, you know, that right there is a, a, another perfect opportunity to make accessibility, including technology accessibility, a part of, of an overall uh, institutional kind of plan and strategy of recognizing the diverse populations that we want to be a part of our campuses, right? Um, and that includes students who come to attend. It includes staff who work at our institutions, right? We want staff with disabilities to work or faculty who teach, right? We have plenty of faculty with disabilities who help teach and create uh, research and knowledge articles and, and all sorts of things, right? And so we want, we want people with disabilities and technology accessibility being a part of that to be a part of our institutional story for sure. And I'm sure many others do, right? That's, so that's a, a great and natural place. Tony also mentioned the, the kind of legal undertones of accessibility. Uh, I would be remiss if, if I didn't uh, explicitly mention my institution certainly uh, faced its own kind of very public legal issues in the past five or so years, um, particularly related to captioning of public content. But the, the kind of 
that certainly helped get it on the radar institutionally, right? No doubt uh, whatsoever. Um, but what we did is took that opportunity, right? And we are including lots of kinds of accessibility, captioning being one very important part of that in our overall digital accessibility efforts. Um, but kind of having that as a, a backstop, if you will, or uh, kind of knowing that that is uh, possible, as Tony mentioned earlier, is, is certainly um, one among many good reasons to be working on digital accessibility because that is uh, costly and inefficient um, to be spending time on those things when we could spend time and resources and energy on making things more accessible. And uh, that's definitely uh, the way to go if you're gonna be spending resources one way or the other. Uh, Not always a bad thing, right? <laughs> that, that, they can help us move our work forward uh, for sure. And then related to what Lori said earlier about, <clears throat> uh, she mentioned she was kind of one of the, the she, oh, excuse me, she was the first to hold her position. I'm in a similar uh, situation. The last few positions I've had at the university have, have been new and created. And so one of the things we, I think is important to helping our digital accessibility work uh, grow and sustain itself and be a, a longer lasting thing, um, which it needs to be, right? The, we're not gonna solve digital accessibility in two years and not need it anymore. I certainly wish we would, but um, th this is a long haul effort required. And so making accessibility as a priority, a part of institutional uh, structures, roles, policies, is critically important to advancing it. So one of the things our institution did, we have a policy about digital accessibility. Um, in the same way that we have a policy around how you can spend institutional funds or how you treat certain different constituencies on campus or uh, appropriate relationships or sustainability or other sorts of things, but digital accessibility, especially for websites and procurement, we have a policy around it. So it's not just, hey, Kyle really wants you to do accessibility, right? And then what if Kyle leaves and takes another job? And then now we're starting from scratch, right? No, there's this embedded part of our nearly 400 year old institution saying, digital accessibility is something important. And uh, there's some, I'll uh, put a link in the chat to our, our IT accessibility website, but we reference some, uh, news articles and things in our community where it's been promoted, right? The president of our institution saying, this matters to our institution, our CIO, our provost saying, accessibility is really important, right? Those are, those are important markers for kind of calling out to the community, this is something that should be paid attention to. And then, uh, you know, how do we sustain it? Yes, we have groups related to accessibility, but something my team has done a great job working on recently is in all new IT job descriptions, right? Accessibility is a part of it. If you're coming to work on security or networking or purchasing not on the accessibility team, one of the things in your job description is you're expected to be familiar with and make your content comply to accessibility standards, which is great, right? Again, that, that doesn't just depend on an IT team. Uh, our institution is currently hiring for a CIO, um, which is great, right? one of the many, many, many responsibilities they have, right? But one of the things in their job description says the CIO is responsible for ensuring equity to all of the great resources that our institution produces. Digital accessibility is a really important part of that. Uh, and so sustaining those things beyond the individual or kind of the initiative and embedding them and making them a part of what you do as an institution, I think is really valuable for the long-term sustainability of accessibility. Uh, Lori, I know you were gonna chime in. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think that you bring up a really good point, Kyle, because your position, although you've been in a variety of different hierarchy steps across Harvard, you're currently not in the provost area or you're not in the uh, chief operating officer area, but yet you have, been, have made an impact on the job descriptions that impact the whole university. So I guess my point that I'd like to make is that you don't have to be in the hierarchy to make an impact. And we're, whatever it is along your path, you're leaving breadcrumbs, you're leaving, uh, you're, as Tawani says, you're, you're influencing and you're um, bringing this, bringing the effort to more people than you probably know. Um, and, and what you're finding, and I think what 
what both all three of us are really wanting to say is that a united voice is much stronger than just your voice standing at a high spot in the hierarchy saying da 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 do this you know if you have the grassroots folks coming up and you have because of your path along the way um that's that makes it even stronger and and in one of our conversations and prepping for this presentation today, Kyle brought up how the importance of peer comparison. Uh, you all know Harvard and Yale. So, uh, uh, Kyle, I'll let you talk about that. And then I want to talk about peer collaboration. Mm -hmm. Lori particularly likes that because you used to work at Yale, right? <laughs> <laughs> At some point, it, was, it came up in conversation, but um, we, we mentioned other ways of getting um, buy-in or uh, considering the legal is really important, uh, why accessibility matters is really important, but something all of our institutions probably do is we have peer institutions that we compare ourselves to constantly, whether it be admissions or academic program offerings, you name it, right? We always say, what are, what are peer institutions doing? That's a normal part of, of the kind of enterprise we are a part of. And um, I think doing the same for accessibility is great. Uh, find institutions that are doing good work around accessibility and com compare how your institution is doing. There are likely some that are ahead of you in certain areas and some where you might be doing a better job than they are currently. Um, but using kind of that normal tool, uh, the executives or the, the leadership or faculty, whomever at your institution are probably very used to making decisions in the framework of name three to five institutions we compare ourselves to all the time, what are they doing, right? With Harvard, sure, it might be Yale or Stanford or Princeton or others. It might be five institutions in your own town or your state or your province or wherever it is, um, or your academic alliance or athletic conference. But find those institutions, and, and that's a great way to show you know, we could be doing more for procurement and accessibility because institution A, B, and C, they're, they're ahead of us. Or, you know, we're doing better in uh, learning management system accessibility, whatever the areas are. Um, Lori's totally right. Kind of using those normal peer comparison tools that your institution makes every day in a whole lot of situations. Uh, as more and more institutions are, are making digital accessibility a priority and a part of what they're doing, um, helping kind of frame the work we do to get buy-in in the same way, I think is really useful. Lori, could I add in too, you know, since um, I'm part of a system, I think, you know, I, I highlighted initially that, you know, we don't always do things the same. And I think that can be a misperception. Um, and so uh, to get our accessibility really off the ground, um, it was through almost our, na our, our state organization of AHEAD where disability directors from my other USM institutions, we got to be friendly with one another. We were all going to the same conference, sitting together, and all of a sudden it was, hey, do you guys wanna meet and talk about this problem that we're all having and we're part of a system? Um, and it was amazing. We set aside time and almost quarterly to meet as directors of peer institutions, all doing things differently you know, yes, we're venting about our challenges, but we're also hearing what some people were able to, to do and who they were reaching out to. And if you're part of a system or a state organization, what's really beautiful is you may be able to leverage contracts that will be beneficial to you. So if we kind of all go together and ask for the same software tool, we might be able to get a bundle discount because do they want one institution buying this pro this program or do they want, um, you know, 12 institutions buying this program for a two or three year contract or longer? Um, so the, the peer institution comparison was great for me on two levels. I was able to go to my provost and say, hey, you know, College Park and Towson are doing this and we always want to be up to speed with College Park and Towson of our USM campuses. Um, but at the same time, I was also able to say, and I've met with their people. And this is how they had how it worked. And yeah, they're a bigger institution; they might have more money. But what could we model in this way? Um, so I think you can use peer comparison for two ways, really, to help move it along and, and see if maybe your your state wants to get together. And I know Lori is probably going to talk about that and her collaborations. Um, I will say, you know, I live in Maryland, and I like to go to 
Lori's conferences um, because I want to hear what Virginia is doing since we're so close and I can say, hey, you know what Virginia is doing? Um, so I use my own state peers as well as my nearby state peers to, um, to get that comparison um, as well as like Kyle said, we have our five that are similar size um, across the country and I always look to see what they're doing. You don't have to reinvent the wheel, I think is a, a point we're making here. Go see what other people are doing and when I see great websites, you don't have to steal it per se, but they probably have ideas that you can make into your own. Um, so I'll let Lori go. Borrowing with modification. Yes. That's what we call <laughs> borrowing with modification. So just building on what both Tawny and Kyle have talked about, uh, this whole idea of looking at what your peers are doing is really, really important and helpful to you. So what Tawny alluded to a state organization that we have here in Virginia. It's called the Virginia Higher Education Accessibility Partners Group. And it takes our state AHEAD organization maybe one step higher. So AHEAD usually focuses on the disability services groups. What VEEP, or the, you know, that's the name of our organization, we look across accessibility and look at it from the holistic perspective. So it encompasses the digital world, the physical world, the attitudinal world. We bring in K through 12, we bring in community colleges, higher ed, and even the state agencies. And what we do is we try to offer um, we, what we call town halls. We have just had a Microsoft, um, Microsoft town hall. We've had an Apple town hall where these vendors come in and talk to us as a group. And we can look at it from a state perspective. And, and another thing that we're doing is we're trying to have statewide contracting around captioning. We're, we're trying to do statewide contracting around some of the other AT tools. But we can do that because UVA, Virginia Tech, George Mason, VCU, we're all in the same room. We're all wanting the same thing. And then we can go to our procurement folks and say, you know, we wanna do a collaborative contract where each of our institutions can benefit. So that makes your conversation with procurement even that much higher because you're doing something that they want the university to do. So the collaboration piece gets me a little bit further. The, the, the um, comparison piece, I've been comparing against Harvard and Yale and Princeton and Michigan and Stanford and Wisconsin and Minnesota, all of the R1 institutions. And it's moving things about as fast as a snail. So when I can do things more in a collaborative effort, I get more forward movement. The other thing I would like to say, just add quickly um, before we go to our next topic, when you want to be at the table, invite people to your table and provide food. Uh, just bring a, and always be nice. Uh, don't bring your uh, club and beat them over the head. This is a risk mitigation issue. You know, always bring food or bring something. Uh, it just always kind of breaks, breaks the ice. And once we can meet again in person, that's, that's an idea. Um, and then as Tawny talked about, provide examples of the impact of not going forward with this. You know, we have certainly in the captioning world, and I'll talk about it in a little bit later, but we've been looking to Harvard, what Kyle has been doing at Harvard and, and what he's been putting in place. It's, it's a great, great effort. And I've been using that left and right to try to get folks to understand the importance of captioning. Um, so what is the loss that we have if we don't move forward with that? And then monetary loss to the university. If we don't put forward uh, accessible uh, digital assets, or especially right now, we've got loss of enrollment. We've got loss of research dollars. We have loss of alumni dollars. Because if we can't get our alumni to understand what we're putting forward in our digital space, and our alumni can't uh, or have hearing issues and we don't caption or they're using a screen reader and they can't understand what we're presenting, then we're losing those dollars. And also reputationally, what is the impact if we don't do that? And as Kyle mentioned, the DEI efforts that all of us are under, the social impacts of not including disability in those conversations is, is really uh, uh, consequential. Hey, Lori, so, I just want to highlight that we do have 10 minutes left. So if you want to choose maybe that last topic, and then maybe we want to take questions just to keep us on track. 
You read my mind. Yeah. So the last thing that we're going to talk about is that we're going to leave you with one piece of advice from our own playbooks. And so, Tawny, do you want to go forward with that? Um, sure. You know, I think I've mentioned it a number of ways about how important relationships are to me. Um, I think it keeps me motivated as well. Um, and it, it, it's kind of similar to the idea about, um, you know, what happens if you do leave? I think like Kyle mentioned, is there, is there a legacy there? Is this going to continue? Um, did you make your mark on the university in that way? So, you know, the, the piece of advice I would say is that wherever you are, you can start right now today. And it can be, you know, reaching out to somebody to have a meeting, or you know that there's a committee you've been invited to and it's upcoming and you looked at the agenda and you were thinking, hey, you know what, maybe I could get on the agenda and, and plug this idea and I had to get the committee talking about it. So I think, you know, my, my number one advice is you can't wait for it to happen and hope somebody else is going to be doing it. Or we can't go from an assumption that, well, everybody knows that IT has to do this digital accessibility. Um, we talk about it, but you know, there's an ownership in it. And until it becomes part of a position, um, it may not be happening at your institution. Um, and so, you know, my number one piece of advice is dig around, look on, you know, these, these departmental websites, see if there is somebody with this role, um, or, you know, try to reach out to people. And if it's, you know, yeah, we can't have coffee face to face, but can we have coffee virtually because you wanted to ask about something? Um, these are the grassroots ways that I've try to do it personally um, and just asking what people are doing and if you can join. I mean, you know, the worst that they're gonna say is no. And are they most likely gonna say, no, you can't come and listen in on this committee. Um, and the amazing thing I found is I asked to go to an IT meeting um, and then people actually started asking me questions and I never thought that was gonna happen. Um, so, you know, I would say like, don't be fearful of it, reach out. Um, start with one person, start with a department, start with a committee. Um, and I promise you it, it will grow, you know, and, um, and maybe you want to do a little bit of that research too. So you have some data in your back pocket to say what those peer comparisons are doing. Kyle. Uh, my biggest piece of advice, uh, I always laugh when I say it is to start a committee. Um, <laughs> to me, it's always a little funny because that's what we do with everything in higher education. It feels like make a committee for that, make 10 committees. Um, but a real, not just a, oh, let's get together and talk about something like a real institutional committee, hopefully with, with teeth or decision-making authority. And importantly, a kind of executive leadership uh, effort. We mentioned earlier that I've been a part of accessibility kind of leading institutional accessibility. Right now it's in IT. I was in a, a rolling up through the uh, human resources group at one point through the provost office at another. And, and the reason that is important, I think it is important where you are organizationally and, and where accessibility is, but um, it can matter a little bit less if you have the right steering committees in place. Uh, so we have a university accessibility committee with the highest levels of the university kind of coming together to talk about and work on accessibility, uh, which is really important, right? To have the senior most people involved in a, at least understanding and engaging with the issues of accessibility. And then our policy says that we need to have a web accessibility steering committee. So I co-chair that with, with a, a deputy provost, right? We have people from our legal counsel office, our communications office, uh, IT offices, um, purchasing, right? Uh, risk management, all those kind of different areas. And, and that's important because it really does take collaboration. It takes a team, uh, it takes all of us working together as it does in so many other areas of our institution. Um, and there are committees for those sorts of other important areas uh, and digital accessibility should be one of them too. So my last little piece of advice is that, you know, you don't have to be in the hierarchy to have impact. Um, and I'm gonna address one of the questions that's in the Q and A. Uh, any thoughts on how you manage burnout in your roles, given how long it can take to enact change? So as I mentioned early in this conversation, I've been in this world since the late nineties. Um, I've been beating the drum since then. Uh, and the past couple of years have been uh, much more, um, focused. And I can't say that I haven't had times when I just want to go forget this. But when you step back and you just take a breath 
and you realize, regardless of where your position is, if you are passionate about this topic, realize that you don't have to solve all the issues today and that you are not going to solve all the issues today. You are laying a foundation for the next person, for the next uh, person with passion to pick up where you left off, modify it, and take it a bit further. So all of us, I think, have left breadcrumbs wherever we've been. And those breadcrumbs are picked up. And the person who picked them up knows a little bit more than they did before you were there. And that's all you can hope for. So when, you, when you're feeling burnout, when you're feeling like, okay, mm, uh-huh, this is done. Uh, take a step back, take a deep breath, take a day off, and then realize this is, you're not going to solve everything. But also be mindful of those that support your efforts. Thank them. Uh, elevate their voices along with yours. And remember that you're leaving a legacy through your efforts, good or bad, but hopefully uh, you want to help more than you hurt, correct? We're all going to make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Just go forward and keep your passion and, and just take a couple deep breaths and, and you can make some difference. Hey, Lori, I saw one of the other questions in the chat I'd love to speak to as well. Um, because I've definitely personally experienced it about the roadblocks. So, you know, we're, we're making it sound like it could be pretty easy to reach out for these coffee dates or, you know, get to the table at these committees. Um, but certainly there are going to be roadblocks. There are going to be barriers. There's going to be um, real fear and concern around funding, right? When, when you look up, if you don't have a tool that scans all your websites to look for dead links and accessibility errors, um, you know, we're not talking about a thousand dollar tool here that's going to scan all your websites. Um, and so sometimes when people hear a price tag of, of something that you're promoting we need, um, you can feel like the conversation gets shut down quickly of who's going to pay for this. Um, and I think, you know, just coming at it with one lens can, can slow down the process, but also you don't let it go. You know, we're passionate about this work. Um, and so if you've heard no once, it can be you know, maybe hard, you want to kind of go back in your shell and say, well, my institution is not going to do this. I guess we wait for a lawsuit. I don't work from that. I got frustrated and got told no from certain areas about, you know, certain aspects of IT accessibility I wanted. And so what did I do? I looked to my other stakeholders and I kind of would say in the most polite way, you know, hey, this seems to be a problem. Are you guys experiencing this? Have you heard this from any students? Um, so, you know, my mode is always kill it with kindness, you know, keep building those connections, keep finding your stakeholders. Um, so you're going to face roadblocks. And I certainly don't want anybody leaving thinking that, that you're not, you're going to face roadblocks. You're going to have challenges. Things are going to change and evolve. Um, maybe the tool you had isn't working anymore and we need to buy new tools or more tools. Um, and so I think it has to be a commitment to accessibility. Um, and, you know, certainly if your supervisor is supportive of the work you're doing, um, use them as your ally. Sometimes I'll go to mine and say, I'm facing this road Block. Do you have anybody else that you think I should go connect with? Um, and he'll often say, hey, you know what, maybe talk to this faculty member who might want to do research on that area. That's another way we can kind of slide in as the, you know, through the, the academics or, you know, so I, I think creative problem solving, not giving up, um, not looking at it as a battle or fight per se, but that truly it is just a roadblock and the, it's a stumbling block. Yeah, I agree with that, Tawny. And, and, um, I, I completely agree. Like, I also try to have empathy for the, the supervisors sometimes and that the, the roles and the work that we're talking about is complicated and sometimes a little scary and intimidating, right? Like higher ed institutions are complex organizations and trying to say what well, I need to train everybody who creates something digital. We have like thousands of websites or everybody with a P card can purchase something like that makes me want to like not show up sometimes of how, <laughs> how big that can be. Um, and so sometimes just given how we have longstanding institutions and silos and the way things develop, it can be intimidating to say, 
we need to tackle everything being bought at the institution today, right? Especially for a supervisor that says, well, our job is to do X or Y or Z. And so I've, I've tried to take two strategies with that. And this is for the blockers and the burnout of A, you don't have to start and say the entirety of Harvard in my case needs to change overnight, right? Like that is, that cannot, will not happen in various uh, situations, but you can say my department can change. My department can look at something differently and then build from there or building those allies. Maybe you have an event that brings together some of the people you want one day to sit on your accessibility committee. Invite a lawyer, invite someone from your uh, communications group that can that can hear about an issue, right? So you don't have to, to, to build Rome in a day. You can start uh, start small, start local, hopefully show some success, show how it's made a difference great if you can get a testimonial from people with disabilities that said, oh, I couldn't do this before, now I can. Or maybe it's you yourself. Um, but kind of finding those little stories that can build over time uh, if, if you can't just change everything overnight, right? Because almost none of us can. Well said, this is Christopher. This, uh, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, Tani, uh, Loy, and Kyle, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating and a challenging topic hasn't it been? Um, when I brought this Loy to you, I was like, how are we gonna do this? And you pulled together two additional great folks. There was so many words of wisdom throughout this. I hope people caught all that. This will be turned into a podcast by every, and just to let everyone know. So we'll, we'll have it available in the next couple of months. Um, barring without, uh, with modifications, I thought that was right there. <laughs> I mean, utilize and the competition piece was a fascinating conversation and and does work and doesn't work in some cases. Town hall meet meetings regarding vendors. I thought that was really interesting. Um, so there's so much here. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much to all of you. And um, we do have um, our next webinar is set. Um, this is session three. It's going to be set on March 25th. It's Smart Campuses Maturity Model. And this is one of two. So please join us. And again, Cheers to all y'all. Thank you so much. It was excellent. Thank you. Audience, thank you. There's Enjoy one. The there's one question left in the Q and A, oh, and I'm happy to answer that uh, through email, uh, so we can all answer it through email if that's okay. Or mm -hmm. if the person is still on, I'm happy to stay an extra five. Mm -hmm. We are we're losing people. So yeah. Um, so okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or reach out directly. I don't know if our contact info is out there, but but certainly reach out. Yeah, we'll definitely do that. We'll send you the question okay. to all of you and then put it out. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope it went as you had expected. It's people stayed on. We got some good questions interesting topics. We could go all kinds of different directions with this. So um, thank you so much. Oh, anytime. Anytime. Uh, I'll be still coming back around. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Lauren.